hey, young adults, welcome. It's Hunter, and I'm going to be your online host today. Thanks so much for taking some time out in this craziness to join us. If this is your first time being with us, it's a little different than our normal Thursday, but thanks so much for joining us. If you would, drop a mention in the comments so we can say hi to you. And before we do anything else, I think it's appropriate if we take our precautions to silence all the distractions that we may have, whether that's silencing your phones, silencing any notifications, whatever you need to do, let's just take a second to push all of those distractions aside so that we can be fully present in this moment. And with that in mind, let's go ahead and go to worship. Well, what's up, young adults? We serve a God who is almighty and holy. So would you join us as we sing and praise the name of Jesus? You made 
making your way, Jesus, in every heart, even when I don't see it, you make a way. You were faithful, you were faithful, even when, even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop, no. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you're the way maker. The way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I believe it, it's true. The way you make your miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I know that that is who you are. And that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. That is who you are, oh, that is who you are, and that is who you are. When you make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, and you are the way you make. Miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you
Beneath the surface of my anxious imagination Beckons a calmness that is found in you alone It washes over every doubt, every Jesus, your presence is the comfort of my soul. There's nowhere I'd rather be when you're singing over me. I just want to be. I'm lost in your mystery. I'm felt in your love for me. I just wanna be here with you. Even the way I won't worry about tomorrow. to focus on the things I can't control. My attention on the wonder of this moment. Jesus, your presence is the comfort There's nowhere I'd rather be 
place we would rather be than to be here right here in your presence, Jesus. Lord, your love casts out all fear. And we have a peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I pray that that just washes over our souls right now in this moment. Lord, you are so good. Lord, have your way in us and through us. We fix our eyes on you and you alone. In his name we said, amen. Hey, what is up, young adults? If I have not had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Daniel. Um, I feel like I should say that I am our online pastor because for the next few weeks I will be, but uh, I'm the young adults pastor here at Rock Point. And man, I am so excited that you joined us um, for today's message. I believe that God is going to speak something powerfully to each and every one of your hearts. Like Hunter said, uh, just do your best to minimize distractions as it can be just a, a bit different watching a message online or on TV versus uh, being there in person. So, hey, before we begin all of this, I, I feel like there's just a lot of heaviness and just a weight that's kind of in this season. And so um, I was trying to articulate what's happening in my home um, and then I found this video and so before we begin I just want all of us to watch this video of what I feel like every home is and if not every home it is for sure what's happening in my house so let's watch this video and we are now reporting all schools closed until further notice oh, Lord Jesus, give me Woo, no school. welcome home sweetie Sit still. Hey, quit, quit moving. Oh, quit, close you're your eyes. Me. Get over here. You were doing your times tables. Get over here. Oh, I already know them. Come do these. You know what? What's nine times seven? Sixty-nine. 
Young man, are you? How old, how old are you? Eleven and a half. How old are you? Sixty-nine. It feels like it. Raising you. I'm like. I told you to leave this in your room. I'm getting sick and tired of you. G get out. I'm bored. Read a book. Read something. Come on, find something to read. Oh. Cosmopolitan. Eighteen ways to pleasure your man. No. Something else. Come on, come on, revive me, revive me! Come on, no hurry! Oh, Jackson, what are you doing? Shut your mouth! I'm getting sick and tired. I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill. Him. Man, I, I don't know how that guy was able to do that, but he, uh, at the exact same time, perfectly embodied my seven-year-old son and my wife. So I don't know how he did it, but it was impressive. And um, truly, I play that so that we have just a little bit of levity in this time that has been um, pretty serious and, and pretty crazy. So, hey, uh, we, we were in a series a few weeks ago called The Roaring Twenties, and I've kind of been struggling to whether or not we just jump back into that series. But the message that I had prepared for the next week in that series was about the, the friends that you hang out with, how they're going to dictate the quality of your future. And it just didn't feel um, like it was appropriate in this season. And so I just want to, as we continue to journey through this, just talk about some of the things that have been, I think, both on my heart and on the hearts of people, I think, in our community. And so uh, last week, if you didn't get the chance to tune in, uh, I had a message on how you and I are called to still be the light. And I tried to give us three practical things that we can do to continue to be the light in the middle of the season that seems like it's really dark. And real quick recap, if you were not here, there was three things that I was saying that you and I can continue to do to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this season of chaos. And the first one is that you and I need to be people that pray with and for people. Uh, let's first and foremost be people who pray. And right now we're going to have to look for creative ways in how we can not just pray for people, but actually pray with people. Uh, that might look like a FaceTime call or something digitally or virtually, but let's be intentional to try to find opportunities and moments to pray with people. And then the second one is let's remember that we are called as Christians to be the most generous people on the face of the planet. So let's share our stuff. We don't have to be hoarders. We don't have to uh, try to hoard up all of these things for ourselves. And the third one that we were going to try to do is to replace physical contact with words of encouragement, understanding that, hey, people are still lonely. People are still struggling in the middle of all of this. And let's just do our best, though we might not be able to be in physical contact with each other. But when those things pop up, let's just send a text of encouragement to somebody that's in our life. So, hey, the, the message that I have for us this week is about something that truthfully has just kind of been um, on my heart. And the, the, these um, few weeks that have been going on in our culture just... Man, I don't know about you, but it's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster for me. And I think part of what's hard is there's never been anything for us to compare this to. And um, I, I think the closest that I can compare what we're walking through right now as a community is during a time of what happened when uh, I was in college um, out in California. So uh, again, I'm from San Diego. And uh, if you don't know, California is like notorious for wildfires. And I know different parts of the country have different uh, natural disasters that, that hit, but in California, man, fires are the thing that we have to struggle with. And if you've never been around or in one of these fires, I'm telling you, you, you just don't understand how like truly apocalyptic these things are. Like to walk outside of your house and see an entire hillside that has flames that are 10 feet tall is just something that is absolutely terrifying. And uh, when I was a freshman in college, again, BC, okay, before Christ, before Jesus, Daniel was, was not Christian. I was, I don't know how to creatively say it, I was staying well hydrated and uh, let's just say that I wasn't low, okay, you can draw the comparisons there. Um, but I lived in this fraternity house with a bunch of guys during what 
I have experienced as literally the worst fire I had ever seen. The college that I went to, the fires got within like 200 feet of it. We were all under mandatory evacuations. I lived in this house that was right by a lake and the fires were literally, they, they came up and over the mountain, came down this valley and up into literally our backyard. And uh, the firefighters were on our streets. Our entire street was under a mandatory evacuation, but me and all of my knucklehead roommates thought that it would be a good idea to go and fight this fire, again, flames that are literally 10 to 12 feet tall, with a garden hose, okay? You have to picture this. There's literally dozens of firefighters with these gigantic hoses, and then me and my buddies in board shorts and flip-flops with a hose feeling like we were doing something. And eventually these firefighters were like, what is wrong with you guys? Like, you're not doing anything. You're just making it more dangerous for all of us. And so they made us get out of there. We had to get in a car and take off. And the, the reason that I tell you that is because I think that all of us right now are experiencing a bit of this feeling of helplessness. There's this thing inside of us that I think we, we want to do something, but we just don't know what to do. And in the middle of those fires, we, we didn't have a ton, but we could at least do something. And the hard part is I think sometimes in the middle of all of this, we find ourselves wondering what can we even do? And if you're anything like me, maybe you've experienced an emotion that if I'm just completely honest, I've experienced a lot in these last few days and it's this emotion called worry. And I know last week I preached a message on how to be the light, but if I'm completely truthful, I felt like at some point this week, I, I went to turn on the flashlight that was supposed to be my light into the darkness. And it was like, if you've ever grabbed one of those flashlights and you turn it on and instead of it, it, it like exuding this, this massive light, the bulb just kind of turns like a slight orange color. I felt like that was kind of my heart this week. And I just found myself struggling with worry and I started to panic and I started to go down the rabbit trails of man, what happens if this gets worse? What happens if this thing stays here longer? What happens if this impacts this? What if somebody I know gets sick? What if I get sick? My daughter was just in the hospital. What about her immune system? And I'm telling you, man, I went there and I found myself starting to panic. And so truly I wanna to preach to you today a message that God has been speaking to my heart all week, and it's, it's really one of the most incredible messages that Jesus ever taught to his disciples on how uh, you and I are called to, to allow worry to j actually be something that teaches us lessons. And, and really what, what I want us to learn from is not to just go, hey, let's just be people who never worry and try to just be people who are never afraid because the truth is I think as humans, we're gonna be afraid, we're going to have moments where we worry, we're gonna have moments where we doubt, but how how do we allow the worry? How can we allow the fear to teach us? Because I believe that it's there for a reason. And so I think that there's three lessons that we can learn from worry. So if you have your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 6, one of the most incredible sermons that Jesus has ever taught. He kind of begins to conclude in Matthew 6. And again, before I even read anything, I want to give us a little bit of context because some of us can go, man, how, how can a story that was written 2,000 years ago apply to what we're walking through in 2020? Like it has, they have no idea of the struggle that we're going through. They have no idea of the fear and the worry that we're experiencing. And I would actually submit before you today that the, the audience that Jesus is addressing the people in this story have way more to worry about than you and I do. You have to remember that the audience that Jesus was speaking to literally 2,000 years ago was a group of people who, um, they, they didn't have Joe's barbecue, okay? For them, Joe's barbecue was literally a dude named Joe that had a bunch of cows and you would go to Joe and you would buy a cow, you would take it home with your family, slaughter it and cook it and that was Joe's barbecue. This was a group of people who, who didn't have hospitals, they didn't have modern medicine. If they got a slight infection, there weren't any type of antibiotics. Literally a guy in their community was going to come forward with some fig leaves and some berries and go, I don't know man, try this. Good luck. The average lifespan in the audience to which Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 6 is 30 to 35 years. Think about that. Most of us listening to this right now 
we have lived two-thirds of the life that we would have lived if we were living during this time. Me, man, I, I'm on my way out, right? Like I am on the very tail end of life with a life expectancy of 30 to 35. Jesus was talking to a community that would look at what you and I are walking through right now, though yes, scary, though yes, difficult, but they would look at what we are experiencing right now today in this moment, the quarantine, the fear, the anxiety, they would look at it as sheer luxury because we have running water, we have electricity, we have food in the cabinets, and I, I know some of us have lost jobs and I know some of us are walking through real things. But I am just trying to get you to understand that the crowd that Jesus was speaking to, they knew worry. They knew fear just like you and I do. And Jesus is going to teach them something that I think if we can grab a hold of, if we can truly see the brilliance in what he's saying, I think it can, it can allow the worry and the fear that we, to, that we experience, we can, it can allow it to be something that teaches us and molds us and makes us more into the image of Christ. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, here's what I want to read. It says, that is why I tell you, not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? He says, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store foods in barns for your heavenly father feeds them and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are. Just quick side point, okay? Part of what made Jesus the most brilliant communicator in the world is he was the master of illustrations. And he's talking to a crowd about worry, a crowd that's gathered on a hillside. And he says, let, let me explain to you what I mean about don't worry. Don't, don't freak out. Don't, don't allow yourselves to get overwhelmed. He says, look up at the trees. And everybody would have looked and there was birds in the tree. And he says, look at the birds. He says, the birds are still singing today. And here's the thing. As I read this verse this week, as I found myself in a position of worry, I promise you there might not be birds out right now while you're watching this message, but tomorrow morning go outside and you will hear the birds. They're still singing. The birds are still singing because they don't feel any of the worry that you and I experience. And Jesus says, look at them. They don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yet somehow they have avoided the propensity that so many of us have to go out and store up a bunch of food and to save it for tomorrow. He says they just instinctively have been wired to trust something that's bigger than them that's providing for them. And Jesus says, you are so much more valuable than a bird. Don't you think God will provide for you the way that he's providing for these birds? And sometimes I think you and I need to just stop and just remember that even creation is modeled to show us that God is good and that he has a plan and that he's going to provide for us. Let's keep reading. He says, aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Verse 27. He says, can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? Man, I think that's a question that you and I have to come to grips with. Can worrying even add a second to our life? Jesus is going to give us the answer, verse 28. He says, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They, they don't work or make their clothing. He says, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. He says, and if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Here's the next verse. It says, don't worry about, what these, don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, and what will we wear? Verse 32 I want to pause after this verse. He says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Jesus uses the birds as an illustration and then he uses the flowers. He says, look at the flowers, man. They, they, don't, they don't know what's going to happen, yet they have clothes to put on. They, they, they are provided for. 
And Jesus says, man, you guys are so much greater than all of this stuff. Don't worry. And the part that's crazy is Jesus brings up three things, three questions that I think are the things that cause us to worry. He says, what are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? And what are you going to wear? He gets to the very core of how are you going to provide. And the truth is the core, the central part of the worry that I felt this week is I wondered, man, what would I, what would my family, what, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we, what are we going to wear? How is all of this going to continue to happen? And the verse 32 is something that we have to see. Jesus says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. He says, but your heavenly father already knows your needs. Man, if you guys hear nothing else that I say today, I hope you hear this. You and I have to remember we are not people without a heavenly father. We are not people who don't have a father in heaven who loves us, a good father, who over and over and over and over again in our lives has met our needs. Jesus was trying to convince these people on the hillside, the thing I'm trying to convince you of right now, though we might feel worry, though we might feel fear, we don't know how bad this is gonna get, we don't know how long this is going to last. We are not a people that don't have a heavenly father. And he says at the very core, the people that ask the question, how are we going to survive this? How are we going to get through? The people who are led by their worry, that are led by their fear, Jesus says are actually non-believers. People that don't know who their heavenly father is. So here's the three things, three lessons I think that we can learn from worry. The first one that I think we see in this passage in the three lessons we can learn from worry. The first one is I think you and I have to learn the habit of prayer instead of panic. I think you and I have to learn what it means to be okay with the tension of not knowing. But understanding that the void that we fill that tension with can be panic or it can be prayer we have to choose. And what I believe that Jesus was imploring these people of and what I'm challenging you with today is to understand, man, this, I promise you, coronavirus will come and go. This will be a story that we talk about one day. And then there will be other things that come that are scary. There'll be other moments in your life that you worry. And there will be this gap in between what you're experiencing and what you expect. And Jesus is telling us we have a choice through which we fill that gap with. Are you gonna fill it with panic? Are you going to fill it with prayer? And Jesus says people that truly know their heavenly father, the gap for them is always filled with prayer. Here, here's how uh, Psalms says it in Psalm 55, verse 22. It says it this way. It says, you and I are to be people who cast our cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. I, I know it sounds almost like a redundant, like a no duh kind of point, but I need us to be people who walk with the confidence of knowing we have a God in heaven who loves us, who's going to provide for us, that he is in control. And though it might feel, it might seem, it might appear as if the world is out of control, I promise you, God is still on the throne. And what he's asking you and I to do is to trust him. And part of how we walk that trust out is when we experience something that's different than what we're expecting, our response is prayer. And we say things like, God, I don't understand what's happening, but I trust you. God, would you take these things? The psalmist says to cast our burdens on God. That prayer is not this thing where we come together and we're like, oh, holy, thou art art father. And we get all the language right. God says, come to me in your brokenness. Come to me in your despair. Come to me in your worry. Don't sit in the corner and try to figure out what you can do on your own. Because the truth is, man, this week, I found myself in the spot where I was so filled with worry and I did what everybody else started to do and I was like, we don't have enough toilet paper. And then I was like, well, why do we need toilet paper? And it's like, I don't know, because that's what everybody needs. And how much, like I've got 60 rolls of toilet paper at my house. Like, what do you, well, I, I guess if this thing gives you diarrhea, like we're cool, but outside of that, I don't know what the panic is. But the truth is, is if we look at what happens, if we look at what's happening in our culture, fear is not logical. It's not rational. And it tells us we have to hoard. We have to provide for ourselves. We have to do it on our own. And God says, you're missing it. You've got me. 
I'm on your side. Trust me. Don't panic. Pray. Here's the second lesson that we'll see in verse 33. The, the, the story continues like this in verse 33. It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything that you need. Jesus is going to give us an incredibly practical step that we can do if we want to not be ruled by worry, but we want to learn the lessons that worry can teach us and that we can be people who fully trust God. He says, we must seek the kingdom of God above all else. That includes CNN, that includes the CDC, that includes all of the things that have great information. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. And then he will give you everything that we need. The second lesson that I hope we'd learn in this season that is so filled with worry, the season that is so filled with fear, is this. We've got to be people who pray instead of panicking, and we need to be people who worship instead of worry. Man, I'm telling you, God asked me a challenging question that I want to ask you today. And he said, man, what are you seeking? What are you spending your time with? Is the majority of your time filled with watching the news, watching the public on Facebook, on Instagram, on video games, doing all kinds of craziness, or is the majority of your time spent seeking God? Because here's what I know. I think the only way that we can battle worry, I think the weapon that we've been given is worship. And what this does not mean is that you just turn on music in your house and you just, you know, sing worship songs all day. Okay, worship is not just a song. Worship is all things that we do spending time with God. And I think we have to begin to learn that this was something that truly I learned this week that I, I struggle with this battle inside my heart where I feel like when I feel fear and when I feel worry, that I'm like sinning. And then I'm like, well, I'm supposed to be a Christian and I'm supposed to be a pastor, so I can't feel worry and I can't feel fear. fear. And, but the truth is, man, we are humans. And feeling worry and feeling fear, it's just part of our human experience. And what I'm learning is that worry is actually an incredible indicator in places in my heart that I have not yet surrendered to God. I think that God has actually put fear and worry in our hearts to allow it to be a bit of a, a, a warning sound for us into the places that we need to work on to turn over to God. Uh, when I had a roommate... Uh, one of my best friends in the world that was doing his private pilot's license, he was talking to me about this, this day that he had to do uh, this pilot training. And one of the things that they had to do is they had to learn uh, how to get their plane out of a complete stall where the engine was shutting off and they were basically falling out of the air. And so what they would do in these trainings, and he was telling me about it as they were getting ready for it, they would have to take the plane and they would put the plane at like a ridiculous incline that they they knew the plane could not sustain. And I know for anybody that's in like the aeronautics world, you're going to badger me for all of like the terms I'm going to butcher. But from my basic understanding of it, what they would do is they would put the plane into a position where the wings could no longer provide the thrust that was needed to keep the engine going. And what would happen inside of the cabin when this was happening is this massive alarm would start to sound inside of the cabin, letting them know, hey, trying to warn them, you're about to collapse. You're about to go into failure. And in their training, they would have to push the plane beyond its limits to the point of failure failure and then the plane would stall and they would have to allow the plane to they would have to learn how to then catch the plane once it was coming back down at a free standstill and they would do that multiple times and I'm like man that sounds like the worst day of my life like that is not something that I ever want to do yet as this week as God was speaking to me that was the the visual that I kept seeing that was the lesson that I think God was trying to teach me that sometimes when I'm getting to the to the limits of my own ability all of a sudden worry shows up and it's a bit of an alarm inside of the cabin letting me know that I'm close to the point of failure and I think something kind of went off in my heart that I hope encourages you today is that worry isn't something that we have to fear because it means that we've somehow failed, that worry is just a warning letting us know 
that if we keep going in the same direction, if we keep heading this way, we will eventually stall out, but we don't have to stop there because we can stop and we can begin to pray and we can remember that we are not people without a heavenly father, that we're not on our own in this. And maybe, just maybe, the worry that you are experiencing is actually showing you the places in your heart that you need to turn over to God. And so I, I say this with 100% love in my heart, but I think you and I have to be careful and we have to have an honest assessment of how we're spending these moments that we have in quarantine. What are we doing with these times? What are we seeking? Because all the things that I see, it looks like the Xbox and the PlayStation servers are about to break and Pornhub results are literally going through the roof. And I think we have an opportunity to seek first the kingdom of God or to seek the things that we feel like are gonna give us instant satisfaction. And what I'm trying to tell you is that if we wanna win the war against worry, we need to realize that there's actually supposed to be purpose in this chaos. There's supposed to be purpose in all of this. It's, it's actually an incredible opportunity, not just an obstacle, that you and I can become people in, this moments, in these moments of quarantine where we become like digital missionaries, man, and we go, hey, look, we're here for this time, and we have uh, like this insane ability to reach out to people. We can go and we can use the digital field as our mission field to reach people with the gospel. Or we can just get through and we can just seek. But I'm telling you, if we are not the people who wake up and go, man, we're going to be intentional with the time that we spend with God. It's part of why tomorrow we start the 90 days through the New Testament. We are going to be a people who collectively, man, we prioritize seeking the kingdom of God because we know from all of that, from that moment, everything else will flow. So here's the last one, the last verse that I want to leave you with. Jesus kind of concludes this moment by telling them in verse 34, kind of sums all of this up. And he says, so, so don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow is going to bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Jesus concludes his teaching and says, so don't worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough worries, just don't worry about tomorrow. And I know on the surface, it just sounds like what he's saying is, hey, don't worry about tomorrow, just focus on today. But what he's actually doing is he's alluding to a previous season. He, he's, he's trying to get the people that he's talking to, the nation of Israel, the Israelites, to remember, you guys have been through this before. You guys have walked through something similar to this before. You've had moments where you were freaking out before. And what he's talking about is in Exodus when God had his people brought out of captivity and Moses was leading the nation of Israel through the desert. They were wandering through the desert for 40 years on a journey that should have taken a few weeks. But because of their disobedience, they wandered in the desert and they freaked out and they wondered where their provision was going to come from and what was going to happen. But in Exodus 16 verse 4, Jesus is referencing this very verse when he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Because this is in Exodus 16. This is the instructions that God all the way back then gave to Moses. He says, then the Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you, right? It, like it's literal pancakes. Like imagine walking outside and pancakes are raining down. Like if that's not heaven, I don't know what is, right? And he says, each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. And he says, I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. God's people found themselves wandering in the desert, wandering without any type of civilization around them. But he said, remember, you're not without a heavenly father and it will make no sense where the provision will come from. But you will walk outside and pancakes will fall from heaven. Just go get enough for today. He says, don't get enough to try to get you through the week, just do today because I promise I will be faithful to you tomorrow. That's what Jesus is alluding to when he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough of its own worries. Here's the third lesson that I think you and I have to learn from worry. And I think the third thing we have to see and we have to learn to understand is to trust Jesus's provision instead of our performance. What I mean is that you might feel the same tension that I do, that you will feel like it is all on you. 
and you will feel the need to hoard and to store and to stockpile and to become your own uh, God. And Jesus is telling those people sitting on a hillside 2,000 years ago, you don't need to do it. But the truth is, it's been part of our DNA since all the way back in the Israelites wandering through the desert. Because even back then, there was hoarders. Even back then, there was people that would go and try to stockpile the pancakes. Yet every night, the food that was more than what they needed for the day would all spoil. And Jesus was trying, or what God was trying to do, he says at the very end of that verse in Exodus, I'm going to test them in this. I'm going to test them in this so that they can know that I'm with them, that I love them, and that I have a plan for them. I wonder if maybe, just maybe, God is using all of this to test you and I who claim to follow Jesus if he's using this to test us, to go, do you really trust me? Do you really take me at my word? I I submit before all of us today that I think the world is desperate for the church to be the church, to be people who we operate understanding and knowing that we have a God in heaven that loves us. That yes, we might momentarily feel worry, we might momentarily feel fear, but we're not gonna let it be the thing that rules us. We are gonna be people who pray, we're gonna be people who worship, and we're gonna be people who trust in the provision of our Heavenly Father because we are not walking through this alone. Man, I I hope you guys are doing well. I pray that you stay healthy. I I literally cannot wait until we can meet again. Um, But truthfully, I hope that this season is one that brings you into a deeper relationship with God and not just one that you uh, survive, but it's one that you actually thrive in. So would you guys pray with me? Father, Lord, we thank you, God, so, so much that it is so clear throughout scripture that you are our provider and you are our provision. And Lord, for those of us who have called on your name, who have made you the Lord of our lives, the reminder is to look to me, to trust you. But God, I know that there's some people that might be watching this message today. And Lord, they've never had that moment. They've never put their trust in you. And God, I pray that the the worry, the fear, the panic that they might experience during this season would be something that would actually point their eyes to you, that would get them to look off of their circumstances and that they would see how hopeless and helpless we truly are and that it would be a moment where they look to you and that we would remember that scripture says that if we just confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that you are Lord, that we are saved and that you enter into the scene, God, you come out of heaven, Lord, you invade our hearts and you begin to give us an entirely new destiny. And if that's you right now, I pray that you would pray that prayer. I pray that you would have that moment with God. But for all of us, Lord, would you show us the places? Would you allow worry to highlight the parts of our heart that we have not submitted to you? And then God, would you give us the boldness and the courage to begin the process of turning those things over to you. Jesus, we love you. We so desperately need you. It is in your mighty and powerful name that all God's people said, amen. What a message, it was so impactful. And before we go, we're in the state of transitioning from a physical community to an online community. And one of the ways we're gonna do that is through Instagram. We have a link in our bio where we're gonna be posting a lot of our content. And two of those pieces of content that I want to address before we go is the first one is our virtual small groups. This is a way that we can all stay in community together, but be apart. And we think it's going to be something that's going to be great, not only for you, but for us as a ministry. And the other thing is we're going to start a Bible reading plan together. We're going to walk through the New Testament in 90 days. And hopefully all this craziness is over before those 90 days are. Um, But if you would go to Instagram, follow our Instagram, rockpointya, so you can keep up with us. And with that, we just want to say that we love you and we'll see you next week.